the total on that 2019 column is the students that were there when we were, did the October child count that we report. So those, everybody in that column was currently enrolled with programming in some way in Greenville County Schools or provided by Greenville County Schools employees. Uh, um, certainly, we have, we have students that um, are identified as having a disability and then no longer need services. These students here require an individualized education plan, which means they need specially designed instruction. So you can have a disability and not necessarily need that instruction. So they have to meet both prongs to stay in this category. Um, if we have a student that no longer needs that intensive instruction, they certainly can go, some of them may go to a plan called a 504 plan where they would get accommodations and that's under a, a different law, but a different type of support. But as they need less supports, we certainly would work to move them out of special education if at all possible. That happen very uh, often? I'm certainly it does. And if you, again, the, the, there's quite a continuum of, of, of disabilities here on the chart, but also within those categories. Yeah. If you notice, the second largest is speech and language impairment. So you've got a lot of students there that, if you've ever had a child that had trouble learning their R sound or their S sound, they're identified as a student with a disability and then it, it would be remediated. So. Okay. And, and while we're on that subject, I mean, it looks like we are climbing by uh, leaps and bounds within the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, is there is there some reason for that? I mean, is it vaccines? I mean, I'm not, not being, but I mean, what, is, what is driving that rapid growth of the autism dis disorder spectrum? Um, well, I, I do believe that the diagnosis of autism has greatly improved, and I okay. think physicians are knowing faster, sooner, better what to look for. Um, we're certainly getting students identified earlier on and by different entities. It used to only be done typically by pediatricians, but now that's expanded a little bit about who can diagnose. Um, you know, and, and I think that we have a lot of early intervention services that are, are needing to be provided, so we want that diagnosis earlier. Which kind of leads into my next question, which was, do the, do the definitions or the requirements for each of these diagnoses change over time? So if we see an increase, is it because we're now, like you said, with autism, yes, recognizing sorry, more of it or, or changing this, the, 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 the requirements? It, yes, certainly. And autism is one of those categories that, that was added um, several years ago. It certainly was on this chart here. It was already a category. But there are edu these are all educational diagnoses and certainly there are medical diagnoses yeah. that might that might differ um, in, in what testing is done in the medical environment versus what's required in the educational environment often differs too. Okay, thank you. And th this is a question I know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway just as a, as a thought provoker. Um, in, these, in these students, we have individual education plans. I think that's what it's, IEP stands for, am I right? Um, and the dumb question is, uh, would there be any benefit of providing something at least similar to that for every student in the system? Uh, because we have all these programs such as the industrial arts and the, all these kind of things. It seems like sometimes, and this is just a, an impression I get, they're kind of left on their own to decide, do I want to be a, a nurse or a welder or something else? And they may go halfway through life and not realize that they may have uh, had a better one. So the question is, is there is there anything? I know we all have guidance counselors. I know that. I, but uh, is there anything along these lines that is, uh, is, is considered? There is a mechanism called the Individual Graduation Plan that we work with students in <coughs> high school as they're transitioning to help pick their courses, pick their path. They have to do an interest survey as well. Um, so, okay. so there is, is something. It's not intense to say that they need specially designed right. instruction, but it is definitely about career path and what courses that they take. Okay, thank you. Um, Down to the working uh, 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 students that are working in various, either, either in school and in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, food service, food and service and nutrition services, or outside in one of the other organizations. Some of those, like the lady, the young girl that was at the Fine Arts Center, they're paid. The, the, at, probably based on the hours they get, they don't fall under workers' comp types of rules, I take it, but I don't know. Uh, if they're injured on the job, for example, are they subject to workers' comp? I wouldn't think because they wouldn't be working full time while they're in school. But um, Doug is going to probably weigh in on that. I see. Yeah, if it's a school district sponsored program and we're placing them, then then we would have liability coverage and, and work on that. Now, if if there's a transfer of the employer employee relationship, which most time does not happen, um, but could, then then it could be workers' comp under South Carolina law, just naturally. 
to the employer, not necessarily. Yes, that's right. Because if there's not the workers' comp uh, protection, then they're open to you know unlimited liability or whatever the current limits are. Uh, so that was just one of the questions. So they have they have whatever coverage is necessary. And I know this is a stupid question that you already have done covered. Uh, also uh, along those same lines, and I'm sure this is a stupid question too. But do we have any issues with child labor laws, or do we get a, some kind of exemption, or do we have a? Uh, that will uh, I think was mentioned there there are some caveats and exemptions depending on on school district sponsored programs but we certainly look to make sure that we adhere to all requirements okay um, I think that's all I have thank you thank you mr. Chairman Ms. Google call on Thank you, Ms. Hogan, for this presentation and I saw a couple of things in there I wish that all the students could be um, um, taught in you know, in the kitchen and all of that. But anyway, um, you said that y'all write a post-secondary goal. I wanted to know, do y'all um, track the kids after they leave the school district? I know you are able to track the ones that are within the school, that get jobs within the school district. How do we know whether they're successful after they leave us? Do we have any kind of tracking system? Frankly, we've just started a spreadsheet to try to keep in touch with them, but you know, if they don't respond to us or they're not the location that we put them at when they left us, that we really don't have a way to know where they have ended up, I mean, if they change positions. Is that not a part of the employability credential, um, After whether they they're going to track them to see if they're successful? Ma'am, I think once they leave Greenville County Schools, if they decide to change jobs, we don't really have a way to, to force that we would know where they are. Do you know whether any of those, um, the um, companies that you use, whether they employ? Yes, um, they are. Yes, there are some People that do. after school? Yes. Do you, do you not track that? Do you not know that information? And I think that the number that we would have would be the number when they exit us. Um, I, I don't, there's not someone going back to each one of those every year and saying, are they still employed? That would probably be something good that we would. I think it, what's happened at this do. moment, we can certainly add that to our list. What, what yeah. has happened at this moment is we still have a partnership with them. Then we know that the student is still there. But if okay. they have gone on to someplace else, then we would not have a way to officially document that. Yeah, we certainly. I want to know if you know if if they're being successful, if they are becoming productive citizens after they leave. You know that would be something good to know. Certainly, but, certainly. I think some of them may have changed locations, though, but may still right. be fully employed. You know. Right. Right. Thank you. That's all. Thanks for all of this, and thank you guys for requesting it. I really appreciate the summary. There, there's a couple of things up here I want to make sure that I am reading correctly so that if I repeat it, I'm, I'm accurate. So if you could just make sure I'm saying back what, what I think I read on this chart specifically. So when you look at the autism spectrum disorder, 35% of the kids in this district who've been diagnosed with autism spend 80% or more of their day in a general ed classroom. Is that, is that correct? So 68% of the total number of kids who have been diagnosed with any of these disabilities spend 80% or more of their day in a general ed classroom. And so they're spending 20% or less of their day being pulled out for, for services. Is that, is that right? You got it. Okay. So then say that again. How does that compare to the state of South Carolina? State total at the bottom, what would be comparison to that 68 is currently 56. And 56 is the guideline or 56 is their current average? The current average. Okay. And is there a, I, I know we talked, we've talked and then I think you mentioned here that we were, some of these were transitions that we made to align with some state guidelines. So is there a, is there a state target that we're supposed to be working towards? They change state targets. Okay. Um, and, you know, some of the targets that we typically get are about timelines for evaluations, not necessarily for students being in general education. Um, okay. it, they, it, the higher the number, the better. Okay. Um, and, and so I'm really pleased to see that we're doing better than the rest of the state. Um, but I don't know if there's been a target set for this school year yet. So when, so when you read 56% versus 68%, is it 
is it because we're intentionally putting more kids into general ed classrooms than other other districts are? I mean, is that I absolutely think that's an expectation is that we don't want to take a child out of the general education environment unless we absolutely need to provide support that cannot be done in that classroom. Okay. So we do everything possible to provide the support and the accommodations within that classroom. Um, you know, it, I think there's a strong belief here I, I, that, that that is necessary. I don't think we have to, to really sell that much. I think folks really understand that and it's very important to us, but we also have done a lot of training with the gen ed teachers in, in inclusion in the past, and we need to do more of that to continue that. Okay. And when you look at something like uh, like reading disabilities or um, particularly dyslexia, where do they, do they fit into one of these or are they a separate group? Um, dyslexia would fall under the one that says specific learning disability. Okay. Um, the state of South Carolina does not recognize dyslexia as a separate category. Sometimes people get that confused and think we don't recognize dyslexia. That's not the case. There are lots of, of learning disabilities, so it falls under that when a student is assessed with reading. Okay, so 5,200 students in 2019 were diagnosed with a specific learning disability, and included in that 5,200 are children who have dyslexia. But not all 5,200 of those kids necessarily are, are dyslexic. Okay. And there would be students that would be have a diagnosis of dyslexia from someone outside of the school district that may not require services, or it may even be that we've diagnosed it, but they may not need intensive services. That that second prong of having a disability and then needing specially designed instruction. Okay, and you know we we talked earlier about autism showing a pretty substantial leap from 447 to 1218 and in nine years, which is significant. That category, though, has pretty much stayed flat. Do you, do you have any, any, any guesses as to why, why particularly autism, and I think now we, we now are required to do a screening that we weren't required to do seven years ago. Why, why would that number be relatively flat when some of the others have seen, I mean, three time, four time? Specific events. learning disability, why would it be flat? Um, I would tell you that I think we do a very good job of recognizing students that are struggling. We were always doing, uh, I say always, we had been doing before it was required that we were screening students. We're, we're looking at students when they come in in kindergarten if that's the first time that we see them. But I think that, you know, really, and that's, you, that's the same across the country. I mean, I, I think that there's a difference in recognizing a, uh, a concern and then it being a disability. And so there has to be some time in there where we give students an opportunity to learn in the classroom to say that they are not capable of learning the same way as their peers. Okay. Um, I think that's I think that's all that's all the questions I have. But I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Ms. Lovett as well. Ms. Hogan, I just have a couple of questions. Can you tell me when you have multiple disabilities and there are 466 of our young people and we're able to put 173 back in the classroom, what type of disabilities are these? Because when I'm thinking multiple, I'm thinking several. So. And, and I will tell you that the definition here is that there would be two disabilities that would basically be at the same level that you can't say that one is the overriding reason that the child has an issue, if that okay. makes sense. So um, you can have multiple disabilities if you have an emotional disability and a learning disability at the same level. You know, what, what came first kind of thing, but they would both be impacting the student at the same level. So that might be categorized as multiple disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk to the <coughs> folks, not on this chart, you will have lots of, we have lots of students that have multiple disabilities. Right. Um, and have lot, certainly, um, we have many students with attention deficit disorder. If they had that alone and they qualified, it would be under other health impairment. But if they also had a learning disability or some, you know, an, another area that that factored in with that. If you can't say one is more prevalent or predominant than another in a student, that's the easiest way to say that's the definition of multiple. Doesn't really mean in the severity of it. Okay, and if there's an emotional disability, what, what does the student do 
to incur that, I hate to say title, but emotional disability, what is the behavior there? There's not one specific. An emotional disability is one that takes some time for the school psychologist to work with and diagnose because it's not kind of like there's an action and then we assess them. Um, we're certainly looking for patterns. Um, we, you know, it, I think the easiest way to explain it is that they can't control their emotions. Mm -hmm. and it impacts their ability to be successful in the classroom. So um, if you look back at the other slide, if the emotional disabilities, oh, I forgot it's a touch screen here. The emotional disabilities, 47% of them are sitting in general education mm -hmm. the majority of the day. Um, and, and I think that speaks to some of the program that we've put in place to teach kids strategies and skills that they can then be put back in the general education classroom. Those are not students, if that would be their only diagnosis, that would, would have any kind of cognitive disability or any reason that we have found that academically they couldn't progress. The reason they can't progress is because their emotions and their behaviors are not allowing them to be successful in the classroom. I mean, and it could be any number of things. Um, from physical harm to, to threats to, you know, just the choices. But I don't want to imply at all that when we have a physical threat of a student, they have an emotional disability. There's a very detailed criteria for that. And that's what I'm trying to figure out, you know, what triggers the emotion to flare up and maybe cause um, interesting behavior. That's what I was, so, but, but they are, I don't want to say restrained, but, they are monitored close enough to where, you know, everyone in the classroom understands that this could occur. Not necessarily it will, but it could. And I think what, what the best thing that I can say to that that you might be referring to is we will do a functional behavior assessment, and we could do that for any student, not just a student with an emotional disability, where we're looking at the root cause of something and, like, what is an antecedent that causes a behavior. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we have strategies that if we see, it's kind of an if-then. If you see this, do this. And we have that, we do that all the time. We create from that a behavior intervention plan. Mm -hmm. that, walks teachers through exactly what to do. Now, if a student has an emotional disability, they are going to have a behavior intervention plan for them, but we also have lots of students who have behavior issues that, that they would have one of those, where we have worked with a team of people, um, and typically the school psychologist is a part of that, to really monitor the child and observe the child and take information from the parents to help create a good plan so that we can do that. Um, sometimes it's difficult. We'll have a child that may have something if there's not a pattern, that's the most difficult piece because we can't prepare and train teachers. You know, it, it, if there's a period of a cool down where you can see a child escalating and you can do strategies to keep them from escalating, that's what we, you know, that's what we have a better opportunity to attack. A child who goes from zero to 100 like that, then sometimes the strategies won't always work. Right. Well, I, I will say there were several, many of us that attended the Bon Secours hockey game, and it was enlightening to uh, have the opportunity to speak with the parents, not only the students that are involved in this internship. After the third, um, I guess, uh, maybe term or our interim process where it's 10 weeks, one, two, and then they move 10 weeks, and then again. Are they eventually maybe picked up by Bon Secours? And are, are they then, because I know these, they're, when you're talking to these young people, they're so excited with certain parts of the internship where they have flourished. And so I'm just wondering, is this one that they can move right in and, and then um, end up with uh, job opportunities. This is the for third class that we have right now. The right. first class, Bon Secor hired every single one of them. Right. They gave them full benefits and, and full-time employment. Um, one of them, uh, a student named Ross, who is still with them, uh, when we were at the hockey game that night, one of the um, chief administrators was saying that they had just had, uh, I think it was their JACO audit or whatever, the entity came in and assessed them, and they praised him very much and went on and on about how what an excellent job that he specifically did for them. So um, certainly they have an opportunity to be employed. I believe that seven of the students, and I think that was seven out of ten last year, had employment the day that we had our ceremony. Mm -hmm. 
um, but they were not with Bon Secours at that time, but certainly they are looking to use them if they can. I think one of the biggest things, and again, when we talk about opening the Connections Cafe at Roper Mountain, is we don't want to hold the kid into one of those areas and try to make sure they have enough. Um, you know, some of those things at the hospital have been stocking. So if you don't like the hospital area or there's something about that, is there, can that skill be used someplace else? Right. So I think trying to make sure that we can expand that for opportunities for them. But yes, ma'am, they certainly have been very gracious and hired many of our students. Oh, good. It was a very enjoyable evening. Thank you. All right. Um, I have a couple of questions, and we have a few minutes left if no one else wants to speak. It's um, can you run down real quick the specific learning disability? So we mentioned one. But, oh. um, can you just spell a few out for me, the specific learning disabilities that are in that category? There's dysgraphia. Um, you caught me off guard, Lisa. Um, dyslexia. I mean, there's, there's a whole, well, I mean, yeah, and dyslexia, but there's a whole, but auditory processing disorders. Okay. I mean, there, there's a, there are pages. Okay. Well, and that's a big number. So that's why I asked, trying to get a sense of what, what that looked like. Because I think I heard you say ADHD, if you've got a kid that's there and they actually elevate to actually needing an IEP, they would be in the other health impairment. Category. Clearly, they would go in other health impairment. That doesn't mean that they wouldn't also have a learning disability. The other piece is we just named the ones we were naming. Pip, when I said dysgraphia, that affects writing. We have dyscalculia that affects math. So I think we often think because we hear about a lot about dyslexia that it's all in the reading realm, but it certainly extends to the writing and to math, and um, you know all of the areas. Okay, that's help. that helps. Uh, the sixty-eight percent. So what's the goal? Because as you said, there's this balance between if you have a student, the whole point, if you have a student that has special needs, they need sometimes need a special environment and they do need special accommodations to help them. So you know, I, I don't I don't want to be falling in the trap, kind of like graduation rate of saying, well, everybody should graduate because everybody can graduate. So what what's the number? And I'll tell you, I'm I the reason I struggle to give you a number is because we can make that number 90%, but that doesn't mean the kids are learning. Right. Yep. So I, to me, it would not be as beneficial. Those numbers have to be in tandem. We have to keep the number of the students in and monitoring the progress of those students in. If for, for districts that sometimes do a push of inclusion and can say they're all here, but if their gains aren't going up, I mean, so as long as the students are progressing, we want them in the general education. I, I, I don't have a target number for that. I'm sure that, you know, like I said, I don't know what the state has set for at this moment. Sometimes that's it's the right answer. That's I mean, I think we don't I don't want us to be in a situation where we feel like a climbing number is always the best thing that that, you know, if we show an advance in that number, that's better. I don't believe that's necessarily the case. And it wouldn't bother me if that number next year was lower because it, it is really dynamic into how those kids are learning and then even how that's influencing the academic academic success of other students because that's been a lot of the concern that i've heard from parents and teachers about pushing inclusion too much because you push in so hard it really we don't have the energy with the number of students you have in the class there's just not enough oxygen in the room for the teacher to be able to deliver all that instruction. So um, I always, you know, we throw up numbers and again, we always think, okay, well, what's it, what's it going to be next year? It's going to be more. So I'm glad to hear you say you will defend whatever that is because it's just a balance. So uh, the graduation rate increase, what, what could we specifically target for that increase? Do you know, have you been able to parse that out? We spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, you know, I, I'm never going to tell you I think one program or anything of that nature. And you know, you're, when you're talking about this, it's, it's one year, and we're certainly watching these kids through their entire cohort. I, I believe very strongly that the supervision of the assistant superintendents and their involvement with getting with the principals and saying we got to look at each kid, we've got to look at where they are. That first semester, second semester, we, we gathered a lot of low hanging fruit that I think sometimes because, you know, we needed everybody all looking at all and, and not assuming that there would be any lower expectations for kids with disabilities. If a kid was close, what do we need to do to get them there? 
um, and really sticking it out for all kids. And, and, I, and I credit um, my counterparts in the gen ed side of the house for that because I think they really pushed their, the, new, the principals at the schools to take a look at that. Data was always in front of them and it wasn't just their own data, it was their colleagues' data. Um, I think in GC Source, there's a lot of things that you can go in now and look specifically at kids. Uh, even now, we're doing, um, I attended all the high school, all but two, I believe, of the high school goals conferences that are not special ed goals. That's the goal for the whole school, but we're talking about how you look at every student and um, you know, be able to get points for various things for college and career ready, but in, ensuring that they really get down in and look at every student individually, to me, is where I would attribute that. And I was gonna ask that question. So GC Source has been a great helper in making sure the gen ed teachers and administrators who have that mindset see those kids potentially. So I think that's middle school parents in particular seem to get really frustrated if they've had a student who's had a plan and had support. A lot of times when you get to middle school and you're changing classes and teachers don't know and that's where I've seen a lot of parents really get frustrated that they don't feel like their students are getting that support anymore. There's no doubt there's a culture shift going on, um, and it's going to take us some while for everybody to understand that, but we certainly are really singing the mantra of, of high expectations and ownership by all. I, I think what the, the change I've seen in the few years that you've been here working with us, um, I appreciate the vision because I really think we've kind of gone in a different direction. We've done some really great stuff, and the money we put into trying to keep students close to their home school, you know, making that shift in the budget, you know, putting that into the budget is, I think, I've seen tremendous gains, so I appreciate that. Um, the one last question I have is about the advisory committee. So I think I heard you say that you've been, you asked for feedback on who, what parents would be great to serve on the advisory committee from, you ask the administrators that? Is that, I would just, say it would be great if we could send out somehow kind of a more of an on call on call to just kind of say do you want to be involved with this because the, sometimes the parents that the administrator might not might not think they're going to be the right person to be part of an advisory committee may bring that dissenting voice or that different perspective that might be really helpful um, in making that a really great centerpiece and I love that we're doing that because I think that's really important. I definitely want to do that. We were trying to figure out where to start and yeah. um, we got the names right about the same time they were setting up their SICs so when they when they asked folks they were having to call some folks and, and ask them so I, I, I believe completely what you said that there'll be folks that might not be tapped into that we need to be looking to expand. And maybe in the community as well you know having some community representation sure. so awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for that. I don't think there were any other questions so that brings this to a close in the instructional nope got one no, more thing one more. two one yeah more. so for for section two uh, item 2.04 we've got the innovative course approvals um, we do have a recommended motion from the administration to approve the proposed local board courses as presented do i have a maker of the motion so moved all right uh, motion made by mr meek and seconded by mr sailors are there any questions on the innovative courses Can we just have him speak of it a little bit? Oh, you, yeah, so uh, um, Dr. Royster, do you want to say anything, or Mr. McCoy, about the courses that are on the list right now? I believe all of these, though, they're approached in two different ways. All of these are uh, requests for approval to seek honors designation, although they're broken out in two categories. Uh, I think you're probably familiar with every one of those, except perhaps AVID, and crafts three, but uh, Mr. McCoy, did you have anything you want to add to that? And certainly he, he or others can answer any questions you all might most, have. Yeah, most of these were just honors level. We talked about ROTC. We've mentioned they've been working on that the last couple months, um, well, really a year. Um, so they finally got those completed. Um, and then the rest were really just some realignment of some additional levels we needed um, to expand into some schools. So um, two, basically two categories. Okay, so just to, yeah, so to clarify, we have these two, we have these two lists. We've got honors, and then we have a lot that are CP that you're saying just follows on to classes you already have offered. Correct. Correct. Just expansions. Are there any questions there? Okay, I have one then. Um, film criticism, too, that's listed as an ELA elective, but they have 
like your components of it that actually have developing your own film. So can that connect to a Kate or, or should it align to a Kate offering? So we um, typically, we look at those, we are allowed to change those as those kind of issues come up, if they come up. Um, the, the, the only issue is some kids in the past had used that as a um, elective credit for English. And so if you move it to Kate, they can't count it as an English elective anymore. They have to count it as a Kate elective. So we usually kind of rely on our schools to help designate, you know, if we need to change that elective, we can certainly change the um, where it sits, but it does tie to the certification. Okay. So when you when you say that, that can count as one of your four English credits? It can count as one of the, um, it can count as one of the English electives, yes. Um, but typically the kids are going to, that's going to be, in most cases, that's going to be a fifth elective. I mean, a fifth English in most cases. Well, you say English elective, so help me remember. I, I, for, for English, is English one is the only one that's required by the state diploma, so um, they can do three others that are... Yeah, it'll be English two now because the EOC moved to English two, but yeah, English um, English one through four now is required. Um, not required. English two is required. Technically, our path is English one through four, but technically you can sub out the English three and English four for other elective courses. Okay, so then how, how do you guys make sure if it's... I mean, no offense, but we sort of joked about taking film you know, film criticism in, in high school as a class. And so as an elective, okay, it fills your schedule, and, and I get that. But now if we're saying it might be one of your four English credits, how are you guys ensuring that the rigor of that is really giving students what they need in terms of English language arts? So I would say there's very few kids last time I looked that were taking that for a, um, a fourth English credit. The only situations I was, I'm was aware of is sometimes when kids transfer in from other um, states, they have three and a half Englishes, they may have... Um, a senior year, they may not have enough Englishes by South Carolina's requirement. And so um, based on what they've had historically, sometimes it's better to enroll them in a fourth English credit, um, but I will, like film criticism, but I will say that also depends on whether the kid is college bound or not. So if the kid is call, absolutely college bound, um, we would typically put them in a class that's going to be covered with one of the English one through four C, um, AP honors or a dual credit English. So it's a very kid by kid. I would say most of those kids are not taking, the majority of kids in film criticism are taking film criticism because they're interested in film. Okay, which is why I felt like it would be a good, if we're looking at kind of completer status and all that, yeah. it'd be great to kind of align that to a Kate instead. And we, I think we have had that conversation. Um, and so it may end up being changed to a Kate course later on. Um, okay. well, I like that. that even more now that you're saying, you're saying what you are about yeah. the whole, that counting for your English, one of your four Englishes for your diploma. I just. Yeah, I, don't, and I think our kids don't already, they, they need more, not less, writing and, and communication we literary skills. So, yeah. okay. Before you go away. Oh, okay, so now Dr. O'Connor does have a question or comment. Do, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you right quick about the ROTC 1, 2, 3, 4. Are those going to be available for all of the programs to opt into if they're willing to increase their rigor? Not that they will just become that, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, so you mean if I, if White Hampton, for example, wants to offer honors level, can they opt into the honors level courses now that we've created them? Right. Yes, they can. They would have to. We do monitor. Um, we kind of have to now because with the honors rubric syllabi, uh, the honors rubric application, we actually have to have on file samples of honors level work that goes with that. So obviously we don't have that now because we won't have it until the course is offered. But we will after the first year, anytime we put an honors level class in, we have to go back that next year and pull samples um, because if the state audits us, we have to have all that availability. So these courses actually have more oversight to make sure they're on an honors level um, than maybe in past previous courses. Okay, and when I spoke to people in the past about changing to that designation, do we have people who are in the military who could help make sure that we're meeting that rubric rather than um, just our telling them what, how to make it stronger, but the people who are actually teaching and part of ROTC and developing that. Yes, yeah, so actually the people who worked on these honors level courses were all ROTC instructors. Okay. We did not, um, Miss Bell actually facilitated that for them, but they were actually all the military, the instructors that taught the class. Okay, and the last thing is I'd love for us to track what happens to enrollment because of this change, because yep. I think that it's just a great day that some students who would never think that they could experience ROTC because it would hurt their GPA might not be discouraged for the wrong reasons from experiencing that incredible opportunity. and. 
um, creating that sort of divide that comes along with, well, these are not honors kids, which I think is really unfortunate to, um, to have done. So I, I thank you for moving this forward. I know Dr. Royster has, um, we've talked about it many times and he's really worked toward this and I know that you and others have too. So I'd like us to pay attention to what, what happens and hopefully there'll be an exciting sure. um, boost in enrollment for I'm those sure programs. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Uh, Mr. Sailors. Dr. Royster, how many ROTC programs have we lost in the last several years because of Pentagon funding cutbacks? We, we have not lost any. We, we've not lost any. We lost one due to failure to maintain enrollment, uh, okay. even after we supported it locally. What we have had to do is pick up some additional instructor cost in some places so the probably the greatest barrier that the cutbacks have had to us have been our inability to add programs uh, the last program that we added was i believe was Mal was either malden or woodmont i think it was malden high school was it yes, malden correct. and uh, we've had some interest from other places i think greer has had a, a, an interest for a while in a program and there's just not the ability to add one they're, they're looking at opportunities to to trim them back. How many, how many ROTC program, programs do we currently have in place? I want to say seven, but let me check and make sure that's absolutely correct. I'd have to try to reel through them in my mind real quick. Okay, thank you. I'll, it's getting close to my lunch time. I might not recall correctly. All right, <laughs> Mr. Sellers. Okay. All right, so uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve the proposed local board courses as presented. Uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, that brings us to the end of the instructional portion. I am glad to say that we seem to be focused on a lot of wigs. Did you guys pick that up? The wildly important goals. I made a note of that. I like that. Um, it was great to see all the the progress that we're making. So thank you for that. And I'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Levent, as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. A job well done. We will now move to building and grounds. At this time, I will turn it over to Mr. Sailors. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The first item of business and order is item 3.01, facility project report update. Uh, Dr. Royster, Mr. Carlin. Mr. Carlin. Mr. Carlin comes forward. I don't know that he has any specific items to report on. He certainly answer any questions. I think one thing you might want to mention is uh, I believe we're making significant progress on moving forward the weight room uh, project uh, utilizing uh, design uh, build process and that we now have all those in the first we we'll call them group 1A and 1B. Yes, sir. You now have them all packaged together. Mr. That's Carl. correct. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, we uh, we met with the successful contractor yesterday, uh, Sherman Construction, to start game planning um, those uh, those eight projects. As a matter of fact, it's actually nine projects we were able to package together um, from what uh, had originally gone out on the street. So that's all worked out well. He's uh, gearing gearing to go. He's got his design team with him and. So we, he's excited to get started, and we don't anticipate any, any um, adversarial or um, pro time-wise problems right now. Are there any questions for Mr. Carlin or Dr. Royster? Mr. Meek. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carlin. On, on the chiller at Alexander, is yes, that sir. complete? It, that, that is complete. We may be still working through some of the... Uh, the issues with uh, closeout documents and some of the payments, but uh, from what I understand, yes. Completed at the school, though. Right. What about uh, Berea Middle School? A few months ago, they had that little twister to come through there and tear down the the um, uh, bricks and everything around the chiller. Did that get replaced or what? It has not been replaced. The design's been completed, and we're in the process of making. Uh, you know the, some of the cosmetic selections to go back with the right color brick. As soon as that's completed, we'll be uh, pressing on with a with a project to replace that. Thank there you. was some. It took us some time. We were looking at some different options on whether we'd go back with some type of a, a different type of wall. I was thinking we could go back with something that was, um, you know, a decorative screen wall that wasn't masonry. But it it ended up being 
cost prohibitive to look at doing that, so we're going back with a, with another uh, you. masonry screen. screen Thank home. you. Mr. Lewis, then Mrs. Grayson. Uh, just two questions. One is about some of the drafts. I just want to make sure I have the dates correct. So we plan on having the building construction completed by August 2021, and we plan on having students occupy that building in August 2021? Well, you, you're, you can turn that on. I just want to make sure I have the Summit, right. Summit Drive, your reference. Drive. Yes. 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 Okay. So, so we will complete it and fill it, or have it be open for students. Be begin. Correct. Begin. Yes. Sir. Fall of 2021. Correct. Okay. The the other question I have about the weight room. So, so I know we. Uh, so, so could could you maybe just elaborate a little bit on the design build and kind of how that how that process works? So there there are three. Basically, basically, there are three delivery methods that are used in the state of South Carolina with school districts. The traditional method is called design bid build, which is your standard. You go ahead and secure a design professional. You put the design together. You put it out on the street. You bid it. And then um, unless something unusual happens, the low bidder is the successful one and goes and does the job. Um, the, uh, the the joke with with design bid build is is the guy that uh, left the most out of his bid is the one that is successful and you press on. Um, there are there are two other methods that have become popular um, in, in well in the last number of years that have been being used throughout the state. Um, one is uh, contract manager at risk, which is the project we're currently doing at Roper Mountain Science Center with the environmental building. That's where you go hire your uh, design professional. Typically first, and then you go hire your contractor sometime shortly thereafter, and then you you proceed as a team, uh, both the owner, the designer, and the and the contractor to accomplish the project. The other the other method that has been used successfully, uh, and I think particularly in this in this project, we're going to see some some significant success, is that um, you hire a contractor who secures the design services. Um, himself and you work as a team again walking through the project but your primary um, point of contact and the one you actually con co contract with is the, is the, uh, the contractor. Contractor would choose the designer? That's correct. So what does that mean that every so uh, this first group of school of schools that are getting weight rooms are they all going to be exactly the same then or are they not necessarily being developed to match so, the school you know we're looking of course to make sure that um, that whatever we provide um, design wise with the you know with the floor plan and those type things are, are, are very similar so we have parity across the district and whatever it is we're going to do but we are going to try to make sure that we're sensitive to the aesthetic and the um, um, the look of the school so that we we're not install, installing something that, that would detract from the from the appearance. So that that's great to hear because I was I, I'm I'm just really concerned that we would design a box and drop it at jail man when no. it may not fit within there. No, and and it may be a, a situation where you know the the existing um, facility allows us to to just design right into an existing wall. There may be a situation where we have to. You know the, the the weight room may stand off a little bit, and we tie in with a with some type of connecting corridor. There are some campuses we're not sure we can even tie it in directly to the building, and we have to be a standoff. But but the ideal will be to make sure first and foremost we've got parity across whatever it is we're doing, and then secondly we're sensitive to the campus, the aesthetic, and uh, and the need the need of the school. Well, from a planning standpoint, kind of the base plan was really what uh, Mr. Carlin described earlier, and that was a short connecting corridor mm -hmm. to a 3,600 square foot weight room that had not part of that 3,600, but separate from it, included inside that building an office, two restrooms, and a storage room. Correct. Now, because many of our schools have different site configurations, that's probably not going to be possible at every place. So every attempt will be made to uh, to place it in a manner that is as convenient as it can be with the existing athletic facilities. But at the same time, there's some real challenging uh, layouts to that. So, some of them, they're, they're not. It's just drop that card in, put, uh, as you described it earlier, uh, 
Hopefully it'll look a little better than that. Drop that box right down on that uh, vacant site right behind the the current gym or something. That's ideal, but all, as you can imagine, all 14 of them just don't have the same configuration that would allow for that to happen. We want it to look nice, we want it to certainly be functional and serviceable for the school and as convenient as it can possibly be. Um, I, I guess the, the main question, and we're comfortable that the contractor who's gonna manage all of that has the flexibility to adapt these designs to each of these different locations where it's appropriate yes all right thank you this is this is our first utilization of design bill so we'll closely track how that's working for us and make sure that our project managers stay on top of that because it is uh, it is a departure for us uh, in something we've used and in fact in South Carolina it has been both permissible and legal to do this for school districts and there have been periods of time where it's not been permissible and legal for school districts to do it for student occupied facilities it always has been for you can build an office building or a warehouse or something like that with it uh, but it does offer the advantage of, of, of speed and efficiency and uh, and should be because these things are so similar in their uh, concept to ensure equity uh, it, it should allow us to to complete the project uh, as reasonably fast as we can do so and get get folks in using these facilities. Mrs. Grayson and Mrs. Wells. Thank you, Mr. Uh, could you send me the timeline? Can you send uh, me the timeline for Blue Ridge when it's available from yes, the Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Just let me know when they break ground. Thank you. Mrs. Wells and Mr. Shamley. What was the selection criteria for the design build that you guys used? What was the process, the selection criteria? I, I don't, I don't have that with me. Um, I can certainly get that for you, but it, you know, it was basically looking at you know contractors' experience with um, uh, athletic facilities, um, their ability to meet timelines, cost estimates, uh, their general experience. Um, this particular contractor has, has a lot of experience with working with um, athletic facilities. He's done work at Clemson, he's done work um, and has a, has a very good reputation. The design team uh, we were very impressed with. Who's uh, that? Uh, GMC. Um, so, but I can certainly get you the details on that. Okay. Well, I guess just really to the, the point of design build or they're great solutions, but certainly there's more than just the bottom line price. Oh, no get. question. And when you're, in particular, when you're retrofitting, that's very different than building a facility. Right. I would not um, recommend design build um, for something like a, a new school or a new addition. Um, but, but I think in this particular situation, it, it really has some advantages. Okay. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to see the selection criteria, but you know, I, I agree. I think there's. You know, site adapting is going to be important for all of these yes, schools. Yes, very much so. so. And that was one of the um, that was one of the things that this particular group had was um, I believe I believe GMC has has civil in, in house. I do, think. Do, yeah. And that was that was something that we thought because of the you know most of this project is how do you take fourteen boxes and put them on the right spot on the site? You're going you're to have to have a good civil. Right. Okay. Yeah. If you don't mind sending that to me, that'd be yes, great. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shamley and Mrs. Lavinus Wells. Both the design, build, and the construction management models. Um, how do you make sure that you don't get overcharged, overbuilt, or underdesigned? Well, we're going to be walking through the entire effort with the design team and the contractor, and they'll have an open book process. Um, we're going to make sure that and they have they we didn't have to bring this up they brought this up they will seek competition in all their bids we're going to get to see what those are um, the other uh, opportunity it gives us is if we see um, anyone in the in the sub subcontractor arena that you know we may have had some some not so good experiences of in the past we don't we don't necessarily have to take that we can we can uh, encourage them to work with, with a, a different sub that we know has has the right capability. Okay, thank you. Are these are these always uh, uh, cost plus? Are they uh, uh, maximum cost? How are they how are they how are they built? 
Um, th this this will have a percentage um, for the for the contractor that goes on top of the sub's work. Could be a pretty high increase, and we wouldn't be able to necessarily control that. Or am I am I missing? No, we there? we 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 anticipate this being being a really good opportunity to gain some traction because of the volume of yep. the work as well as the the somewhat repetitiveness of the work so that we can we can save some costs. I agree with you that these would not be appropriate for building a new high school or a new central office or something like that. There's just too much to, 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 to deal with. Um, so I just they, that all three of those methods have their strengths and weaknesses and I and I, I think all three of them have have their application and, and are more suitable depending on the situation. But I think with this one, it's a perfect opportunity for design build. Do we have in our contracts? Do we have any uh, safe harbor or escape clauses in case we're having problems? We do. Okay. And do we have any what I would call functional specifications that we provide the contractors? I.e., you've got to have so much uh, capacity for people using the weight room at a given time, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it might be. I don't know what those would be. Well, specifically, we have our our district um, uh, design guidelines yeah. that they'll be using. But again, we're going to be working with their design team, the contractor, and our folks. You know, walking through the whole process, so we'll have input on everything. I know in the construction industry, I shouldn't say that I might step on somebody's toes. It was usually, or what, at one time, was a joke that you know they make their money on change orders, and uh, I've seen entire buildings built on change orders before. So uh, you have a method to make sure that you're not getting eaten alive with those. Yes, sir. and again, the, it, you bring up a very good point. You know, the traditional design bid build, bid build method was ripe for uh, opportunities for change orders because unless the architect, uh, his, his set of plans and, and drawings were not absolutely tight, the, the contractor who left something out perhaps was looking for every opportunity to to be able to, to put get things back in, in in the project and in his in his bottom line but but the intent with design bid build and cmr is that if you're if you're walking through the process together you're identifying those loopholes ahead of time and and we shouldn't anticipate change orders yeah i think i would encourage you like you say to walk through that constantly and be on top of it uh uh the, the key with any of this big. is that you've got to have a good team yeah you got to have a good contractor you got to have a good designer sure. And then you have to have competent staff um, from our side of the house to make sure that we're we're all we're all doing our our part and our due diligence and and um, and I think we've we've put the right team together. Thank you. Yes, sir. You do realize I work for a general contractor. And that he was stepping <laughs> on your toes, Chuck. Vote on this, right? Stepping the vote on. I know I stepped on somebody's toes. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll give you. A, I'll get you and get me a new pair of shoes. Just over with. I'm just trying to use That's my. That's okay. Uh, Mrs. Levin as well. Yes, thank you, Mr. Sailors. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, we already have the design in place for the addition to Summit Elementary, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It is well. It is very close to complete. Okay. Once we have it completed. Uh, or will you make a presentation or will somebody make a presentation to the PTA at Summit Elementary? Certainly. And also, can we, once it's completed, can we put that on their website? I don't see any problem with that. And then once Similar to what we say have done at uh, Fountain Ann High School. Yes, sir. That yes, would be great. And also the timeline there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. One else. Uh, Mr. Sutherland has a question, so without objection, I'll extend for five minutes. Mr. Sutherland? We foresee any cost increased in our weight room for the next four years? No, sir. Are we logged in? Based on what, what we have provided today. So they can't raise the price on it? That's what I'm asking, Mark. No, sir. They're, they're, con they're contracted to perform in accordance with, with the information we gave them on the budget figures. And, and what you've seen and approved. So, so those, he's, uh, and now he's talking about the first. I mean, the first nine. Nine. So they're they're locked in. Okay. We don't anticipate an issue with the no. subsequent ones, but those nine are locked. Right. In. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much, Mr. Carlin. Yes, I sir. appreciate your time. Our next item of business and order is item three point zero two. The uh, approval of a right-of-way for improvements to Fountain Inn High School. Mr. Sailors. Yes, ma'am. 
I move to approve the deeding of 1.975 acres of land at Fountain and High School to the Greenville Legislative Delegation Transportation Committee for road improvements at Quillen Avenue, Cross Road, and Hellam Street, and approve construction slope permissions. I have a motion properly made and duly seconded. Any discussion? Mr. Meek. Crystal. Oh, have we ever deeded property to the... To yeah. the uh, Transportation committee before? That's the same question. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been here, but I'm understanding this is a fairly common practice. We deed it to the committee while the construction is going on. Once it is complete and DOT has accepted what we've done, then they take it over. Never seen it brought to a motion, and I can't recall ever doing that where we brought it to committee. The, when I read over the uh, contract, the project doesn't go through there's no stipulation in there that they give it back to us is there, is there? i know and they probably will but i'm just saying there's nothing yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they've actually already appropriated the funds to pay for it so uh but i'm sure we can put a reverter in there if, if, if we need to do so we'll research your question make sure before you take final action at the board meeting it, it seems a, it seems a rather convoluted way to do it but that's what I, I assume they're doing the project through Co-Transco, Co -Transco, who then turn it over to SCDOT as opposed to it going to SCDOT and them contracting it out. Correct. If I understand correctly, what's going through the whole process, the school district is not liable for any of the construction or anything that may happen. That's correct. So it just takes it out of our hands completely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. So, just, so we haven't done this this way before. Why are we doing it this way now? I would I not, think, I would I not answer that today because I'm not sure of the answer. We'll get you the answer before the board we, action at the end of the month. Were we asked to do it this way? Yes. By whom? I assume by the county transportation authority, the whatever they call the CFUNS, I'll call it the CFUNS committee. It's not what they call it anymore. But right. I, we don't want, we don't need to try to answer that question on the fly today. Okay. We need to have we need to get that answer okay. to you in writing, and we'll do that as quickly as we can. The the other question I have is this is is this specifically about uh, car traffic, or are they also doing a study on sidewalks? Bicycle lane. The, I mean, is it all of that? Or th it, this would have only to do with vehicular traffic, mm -hmm. and this would be in accord with what OSF and SCDOT have already approved for ingress and egress from the property. So all those approvals are already done. Uh, the county, I can't want to call it C Funds Committee, their, their successor, they've already approved the funding for it. All right, thanks. Other questions? Ms. Wells? So, um, so have we looked at how they're, from a construction standpoint, how this is going, how this is going to impact our facility? If I remember on the site plan, we, we push up pretty close to, not on Quillen, but the other, the other road. You know, we've got a, like a, either a pond or a bioretention area or something and yes. they talk about Helm, needing Helms, I think is yeah. the one you're talking so about. So they're talking about needing they're having construction slopes. So do I mean do you understand what the from a elevation change and from an impact standpoint what that's gonna look like for the, our site? And, and I'm thinking to the point of the fact that this is more about vehicular access, we've we've really tried to push really hard and partner with folks outside the school district on making sure that we have accessibility for bikes and for walkways. That's so, correct. So with this happening and going, what I assume is they're doing it this way because they're trying to accelerate the, the timeline of it. So with it moving kind of fast, just do, do you have an understanding of how this might impact any other sort of access from a pedestrian or a bike standpoint, from a mobility access standpoint? I don't, because our, our uh, designers have been working with Cotransco through the, this entire design okay. for the site. So th th there's a part of the, the easement language that says, you know, the, the, the contract will have the ability to come on the site to um, 
to make adjustments and slopes and, and those kinds of things so that right. it ties in neatly with his design. Right. But I, I'm not aware of any anything involved in this that would make major changes out there that they have not taken care of in the overall design, taken taken into account with the overall design. Okay. Well, can, bef before we approve this in two weeks, can we can, can we just can you ensure that what well, that we're not giving them permission to go do something and they're not moving so quickly to do something yes that it's absolutely. going to actually you know hamper what we're trying to do there with giving no, people I'm, I'm not aware of this being on a timeline other than what our normal ordinary timeline no. would be for project design and construction okay. well I just again it, it's an odd way to to do the work so I assume maybe they had some schedule driver for why they wanted to no, do it was not way. a scheduling issue not for them okay so I just I'd like a little more clarity about what the impact is as it inter interfaces with our site. The only thing I know that would be driving their schedule would have been the approval of the funding for it, and that occurred mm, several months ago, I think, a couple, three months ago. Okay. Thank you. Me. I was just going to clarify. I, we may have done this every project, but I just don't ever remember us doing that. You know, my memory is not as great as it used to be, but... I just don't remember us ever doing it. But as I said, we may have done it every time before. I I'll tell you, it, it, it is an unusual um, project in that the, the legislative delegation has never granted the size of money they did to this project. Oh, you have some insight. Mr. Meek, I believe we've done it once before in this, this model, um, but, but we will look into it more in the next two weeks and get the information from Mr. S Mr. Carlin as, as discussed and, and possibly put a sort of reversionary clause in there to, to alleviate any concerns as well. So we'll, we'll work through the next. Like everybody else, I don't think it's gonna stop, but I just. Sure, I... sure. That it? Mr. Sutter. Describe for me construction slopes and why the committee here, the transportation committee is requesting permission for them. So as they're as they're do as they're making the necessary road improvements, sir, to uh, to uh, widen the existing roads, put in the right uh, turn lanes and access points to get onto our campus. There, there's a there's a portion of our property that we're we're proposing to deed to them in, in the way of right away. But there's just to make sure that that we're there. Their work stops and our property begins. There's some tie-in points that we need to make sure that are are um, harmoniously tied together. And so, part of the allowance we give them in the language here is to to um, uh, to trespass on portions of our property that are not part of the necessary necessarily part of the right-of-way, but gives them ability to make those tie-ins appropriate so that long-term we don't have erosion issues and, and problems um, for vehicles or, or, or our site. Is this part of the two acres we're digging over to them or giving them permission, or is it something else? Well, the slopes portion would be areas on our property that, that may need to be slightly modified to make all that tie together. Okay, thank you. Ms. Wells? I guess, I guess just to be more specific, if we could also get then a, a construction easement exhibit or a right of entry exhibit that would show us the impact, like how far do they think? Because because we haven't specified, did you say that you thought within that right of way is where they're going to need the construction slope easement? No, outside of the right of way we're deeding to them, right? Correct. We give them ability, in the language here, we give them ability to, of course, do the work within the right-of-way that, that we, were, we are proposing, and or they are, they're requesting. But also, it gives them the ability to trespass onto our property to make sure that they're doing the tie-ins. Right. So, really, you know, if the roadway any... stops here, and they're going to have to make that Right. But it could, be, it could be 100 feet, or it could be 1,000 feet with the way this is written. So. I'd, I'd like for them to have some sort of exhibit that would at least specify what they think their transition, you know, how much are we giving them construction, how much construction easement are we giving them, just to be sure that they have thought that through. I'd just like to see we'll an exhibit We'll take care of that. that. Thank you. That concludes the portion of our building and grounds agenda, Madam Chairman.
Oh, yes, yeah, right. I'm sorry. Forgive me. We have a motion on the floor properly made and seconded. Any discussion? We've already talked it to death. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Now I'll give it back to Madam Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you so aye. much, Mr. Sailors. You too did a job well done. Thank you. At this time, I will entertain a motion to. Yes, Mr. Me. Is your mic on, Mr. Immediate filing the cow. Thank you, Mr. Meek. And now you'd like to make that motion? Motion to adjourn. Uh, all in favor, please address by raising your right hand. All opposed? The motion carries. The meeting has been adjourned. Thank you.